Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. So this week, Cheryl and I and, and our family, we made a, trip, uh, made a trip to Kansas, so we missed you all last week. You know, I mentioned it to Pete up front there, and I couldn't believe what he said. He said that he once took a bus across Kansas, and it was the most boring trip he's ever been on. <laughs> that was his welcome back to us. I, I will tell you, you have to love, you know, how beauty's in the eye of the beholder. It is very beautiful to us. There's no question about it. And so we had a great time. You know, Cheryl and I grew up there, and Jude was actually born there. And so we had a wonderful time with both sets of parents. It was a joy, but it sure is good to be back. And then I do realize again, you know, Kansas is probably not like a bucket list place for all of you to go to. But there, there's a couple of people here that, that are from there. So, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and if you like the big skies, I think Rich Mullen said, over Kansas, the whole universe is still. And I've always loved that beauty. So beauty of, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. You know, this week in, in chapter 7, of Paul's letter to Corinth, the Apostle Paul is going to venture into a line of questioning around Christian marriage. And it seems that some there in the church there at Corinth had reached out to Paul about the subject. You see, for Paul, you know, in his day, he didn't have things like the five love languages. He didn't have that, right, to, to go to as a, as a reference. And he didn't have books like Love and Respect, which is just an excellent book on marriage by Emerson Egricks. I, I can't, you know, recommend that enough. And Paul also, you know, he, he didn't have uh, Christian marriage counselors or any other parachurch ministries to send people to for resources. Paul didn't even have his letters that he had written to Ephesians and Colossians where there was just excellent counsel. He hadn't written those letters yet to reference, right? And so Paul was relying on the inspiration of God in the Old Testament to respond to some challenging questions about marriage and sex and some other related subjects. So we're going to turn to chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians together. And the Apostle Paul, it's going to be verse 1, the Apostle Paul begins first by responding to questions mostly about husbands and wives but he also includes some comments about being single as well, saying in verse 1, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife do her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come back together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this matter and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? There's a lot there, right? I imagine your minds are reeling. 
You know, as I look around the room right now, I recognize that there are people of, of all ages. But the scripture is, is pretty forthright here just about things related to sexual intimacy and things of that nature. And I just want those parents out there that are wondering right now, is Tony going to use discretion? I will. But I'm going to try to speak to these things respectfully because it's in the Bible and it's there for a reason. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your word and we thank you for the gift that it is. We know what you said through the, the prophet Isaiah when you said, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And so as we sit before you, Lord, in your scriptures, we pray that we would have an encounter with you. We pray that you would speak to each one of us, that you would give us ears to hear you. We know that when we come into this place, there are so many distractions and there are so many things on our minds. There's so much clutter that fills our heads. But God, we want you to open up, open up our, our hearts to you because we know that you dwell within us for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. We have your spirit to give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you're saying to us, regardless of whether we're married, whether we're divorced, whether we're singles, whether we're struggling in a marriage, to hear what this message is about when it comes to relationships. And it's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Our message today is called What Matters in Relationships, by the way. And what an interesting study this has been for us these last several weeks. If you're visiting with us, we've been studying through the, the letter, the first Corinthians letter that Paul had written to the church there at Corinth. And up to this point, Paul has been writing to, to put out fires. There was factionalism, kind of a favoritism that was happening at the church. And he's also addressed church members uh, about the fact that they had actually taken one another to court. And, and he was just appalled that this had happened, that brothers and sisters were taking each other to, to court. And as you may remember in chapter 5, Paul even made mention of a specific issue. There was a man there in the church at Corinth who had actually taken his father's wife as his own. You know, we believe it was a stepmother, but that's still really bad. But as shared earlier in this sermon series, Corinth's reputation for sexual immorality just wasn't good there. And in Greece and in other areas of the Roman Empire, a person called a Corinthiazomai meant someone was acting like a person from the city of Corinth, just corrupt as can be. And a Corinthiazomai was a byword implying that you were living or acting like someone who consorted with prostitutes. So it was not good to be called that, right? And it is my belief and others too that the over-sexualized social climate was a major reason the Corinthian church had basically reached out to Paul and asked in these verses, should we just be celibate to be holier? And, and, and what do we do in situations where there's an unbelieving spouse? You know, in a sense, in their question is they'd reach out to Paul, and these are his responses. In a sense, there were, the marriage was actually being disparaged in the line of questioning, but they were actually just trying to figure things out and, and figure out how to best follow Jesus in a messy world. We could use help with all that, couldn't we? That's what they wanted. And so Paul answers their questions, beginning in verse 1, when he said, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each man have her own husband. So those two verses kind of kick up a lot of questions here, don't they? Like, is Paul actually saying that celibacy is more spiritual than a monogamous marriage? I mean, he did respond right there in verse 1, where he said, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But if we take the entire counsel of the word of God regarding marriage into consideration, we're going to be able to more properly glean from his statements what he's actually saying about sexual relationships in response to just the general confusion around sexual immorality in Corinth. See, celibacy can create ample margin time 
for godly devotion and service because it's a, a life essentially that's undistracted by relationship and Paul's gonna speak to that. But when someone makes celibacy, and this is important, when someone makes celibacy a religious decision instead of God's decision for their life, meaning they make celibacy a decision by their own volition, without God's counsel. When someone makes that choice, this act of volition, determined by some man or woman, may actually just become an imposter for purity. I mean, why? Because purity in marriage is also very godly. I mean, Paul went on to say, nevertheless, in verse 2, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. And that phrase there, because of sexual uh, morality or immorality, in verse 2, is more literally on the account of fornications. Let those who are married have his own wife and each wife her own husband. So it's important to remember in this section of Paul's letter he is not providing the complete biblical record uh, on the place of marriage in God's creation. And you can imagine for me as a pastor, I'd like to make this about a six hour sermon so we can just cover everything about marriage. We only have about 40 minutes together. And like Paul, he, he's not gonna go into the whole record on marriage and what marriage is, et cetera, et cetera, because there's so much nuances about it but I'm not gonna make this a six hour message. We'll make it just about a 35 to 40 minute message. But he is going to only answer specific questions about marriage. The Christians in Corinth, they believed that sex and marriage could have been inconsistent with holiness. They were just feeling that. Is it possible that just sex in general is inconsistent with holiness? But sex in marriage was actually God's idea. And when it's expressed as God intended between one man and one woman for life, it's the only holy alternative. Definitely the right alternative to the infrequent or frequent fornications that can sexually tempt and sometimes overtake even the people of God. So before we continue, it probably makes sense to take just a few minutes together to look back at the day God chose to ordain marriage as the closest of all human relationships. On the sixth day in creation, this is kind of how it went. The Lord God said this in chapter two of Genesis. He said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he had made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. If you are married at this time, you may or may not know how profound this truth is that we're about to talk about when it comes to the first of two concepts we're going to spend some time focusing on. And the truth is this. What matters in marriage is that it's oneness glorifies God. Your marriage, if you are married, actually glorifies God. In fact, oneness is the hallmark of God's intentions for the institution. And the word hallmark defined is a, is a distinctive characteristic of something or attribute. It's an official mark on something to indicate its origin and its authenticity. Marriage originates with God and will forever be something that reflects the, the Lord's own triune nature. I mean, consider God's oneness. When the Lord created man, he said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. We serve the true God who is Father, Spirit, and Son, the Godhead three in one. And we could also go on and on and on about Jesus being likened in the scriptures as the bridegroom of the church. 
Marriage is, is representative of the unity or the oneness we have with Jesus who gave his life as the bridegroom for us to be able to experience in him the deepest and richest of all relationships with God. That's why the enemy will take aim at your oneness. He will. He will do this to married people. Your oneness as a married couple is the spiritual glue that binds Christian hearts together in mission and marriage. Oneness is the seal that keeps a man and woman in love and in vital relationship. So Paul continues with a little more wisdom in verse 3 regarding sexual intimacy between husbands and wives. Saying, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband... The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. And you can see there towards the end of those comments, Paul is saying in verse 5 and 6 that there may be a time that either member of a couple may, may feel compelled to, to abstain from showing the other affection or sexual intimacy and thus deprive the partner uh, of, of that, that relationship because of fasting or, or prayer time or some other reasons. And these reasons make good sense to Paul as permissible reasons, and that's why he uses the word concession. But then Paul encourages the married couple in verse 6 to come together again so Satan doesn't take advantage of any prolonged absence of affection to tempt the married. So here's what I want to say about that. This is where it's hard for me to be quiet, okay? I want the scripture to speak for itself. But when it comes to these things uh, like this, like, like abstinence in marriage, not being together when it comes to sexual intimacy, Paul does provide a couple of reasons there on which it, which it would make sense for it not to occur, right? There's prayer, there's fasting, things like going on as someone has some type of need in that area in that particular relationship. But I would like to just put out there, there are other reasons that people might abstain from one another due to uh, challenges that are going on in the marriage. Uh, there could be other reasons that are legitimate where that space is just needed and something to be very, very clear about when it comes to the scripture. The scripture is not a big stick to ever be used on someone. Does that make sense? It's not a power play. If you use the power, you never had it. You don't understand the scripture. I want to be very clear about this. This world right now, I'm leaving the notes, could get dangerous. <laughs> this world right now, when it comes to how relationships are depicted, especially in the area of fornication related to pornography, there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of force. It's scaring young women when it comes to relationship. There are studies validating that, okay? That there's an aggressiveness. When it comes to a husband and wife and what Paul is talking about, there's nothing aggressive about it. There's nothing that's powerful about it. It's not something that's used against, against one another, right? If you truly love each other and your wife's body is like your own and, and your husband's body is like your own, you're going to know how to operate to this with a real common sense approach. But the scripture is not meant to be used as, hey, this is my right. No, we don't have any rights to ourselves at all. In fact, the husband in the Bible, Paul says later in Ephesians, your role is to essentially give your life to your wife just like Jesus gave his life for the church. So as a husband, that's, a, that's giving everything, right? And women are to submit in their ways. Women are to be loved. Men are to be respected. Paul teaches on these things in marriage. But as we read through this, the absolute wrong thing to do for any man or woman is to go back to your homes and say, the scripture says this, there's going to be some affection. That's absolutely wrong. It's ungodly. 
Are you okay if I broke off the notes there? <laughs> I think I'm okay. <laughs> so now if I could just find my way back. <laughs> Listen, Satan will take aim at a Christian marriage. Brokenness is, broken oneness is break, breaking something God wants whole. So that's why Satan would take aim. And, and sexual intimacy is part, of, is part of point number one. Sexual intimacy is a physical expression of marital oneness. And for those married or those single here today, I can only imagine how some of our minds right now are thinking about these things with this general advice. And before we discuss it any further, I would like to take a very straightforward look at those verses with the help of Larry Christensen's book. He talks about those verses very specifically. He wrote, in plain language, this means that if one partner desires a sexual relationship, the other should respond to that desire. The husband and wife who adopt this down-to-earth approach to sex will find it wonderfully satisfying as an aspect of their marriage for the simple reason that the relationship, and this is key, is rooted in reality and not in some artificial or impossible ideal. Key there in Larry's comments towards the end is something he said about what makes virtuous relationships with affection. And, and, and I, where I'm going with this is that romance and intimacy must be based on real love and genuine affection of a couple concerned primarily with their partner's needs and wants. But it must be grounded in reality. And this reality includes a sensitivity too, right? When in that area to any type of, of past hurt. There's a sensitivity to any kind of hangups in that area that a husband and wife, if they truly know each other and love each other, will get. And this down-to-earth approach is really what Paul even speaks to, but here's the challenge as I alluded to it just moments ago. Entertainment romance as we see it, there's so much of it out there virtually. We can watch it and what romance looks like and what passion looks like. And how many men and women out there have looked at that and said, that doesn't look like anything that's going on in my house? It's because it's pretend. <laughs> Those people are acting like they love each other. It's all pretend. And we spend so much of our time watching pretend romance and then Cheryl and I kind of scratch our heads going, whoa, what's wrong with us? We don't really say that. Maybe she's thought it, I don't know. So, so this is a danger for us, okay? Entertainment romance is adults simply acting affectionate or pretending like they actually love one another, perpetuating that impossible ideal that Larry Christensen is alluding to. And you know what? A good Christian man and woman, they're just gonna know how to operate to Paul's direction. And if you're not married, and you are one day, you're gonna know how to operate to Paul's direction. But in these verses, I think it's, it's important to remember, Paul is also writing to singles in the church. And there are many here in our fellowship who are single. And I'm going to take a moment for just a disclaimer as we're more than halfway through this. We have singles. We have people that have been divorced. We have people that have been remarried. We have people that are single that have wanted to be married. We have people that are single that don't feel called to be single. We have people that have lost spouses. We have everybody in this room and we have people that even as I'm talking about marriage right now, it's like a dagger to your heart. I just want you to know God knows that. Because some of you have lost someone you were married to. Some of you are, are, are lonely in that area and would love to have a companion. Some of you have been hurt in marriage and it's painful. I mean, it's, it hurts so bad, right? But our Father in heaven, I think of his words again from Isaiah 40, comfort, oh, comfort my people. He wants that comfort for you. And he knows even as we're talking about these things, 
He knows what's happening here. He knows what's happening here. And all that stuff you feel, he's so aware of it. And what's pretty cool about what we're reading today is that, is that Paul is not going to be negligent even speaking to singles because Paul, in fact, was probably single. He's been married and he's been single. So the person writing this is not like me that's been married for 30 years. 32, make sure, for the record. <laughs> Paul has been married. He's been single, okay? And I wouldn't just be negligent to not be considering our singles and everyone in all those areas right now while teaching on this. It puts a lot of pressure on me for good reason, right? Because there are a lot of people walking through a lot of different things in these areas. And during the time that Paul wrote this letter, again, he seems to be unmarried and he addresses singles now. And he's going to later in the chapter. But right now he's still focused on marriage and he says this in verse seven, for I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. You know, there is some unsettled debate as to whether Paul was a bachelor or a widower at this point in his life. I believe he was single, and it's very possible that his wife left him when he gave his life to Jesus Christ, or she may have died. David Guzik wrote that, th this about Paul's day. He said, Jews considered marriage a duty to the extent that a man reaching 20 years of age without marrying was considered to be a sin. And unmarried men were often considered excluded from heaven and not real men at all. It was kind of the, the cultural mindset at the time. And since unmarried men could not be a member of the governing Sanhedrin, Paul was probably married at one time, given the fact that he actually cast a vote against Christians. That's another neat part about Paul. This man did a lot of bad things. <laughs> and evil things, and at one point cast a vote against Christians, and he, he approved of them being stoned, essentially, and jailed. And now he's writing this about Jesus Christ. It's a pretty cool testimony. But he goes on to say this about the singles and the widows, and again, thinking about our diverse fellowship here, it's neat to know where he's coming from, his experience, and Paul writes his response to their questions about marriage, knowing that there are benefits uh, each, each state of being married or unmarried brings. He writes knowing there's challenges with both. He, both. he, he writes knowing uh, that marriage has benefits, singleness has benefits, each uniquely contributes to the kingdom. And Paul, again, ultimately writes as a man who knows the pain, temptation, and challenge that can come to both marrieds and singles. And so to the singles and to the widows... Paul says this in verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain as I am. And if you look back at verse 7, he had said each one has their own gift. So apparently his gift of being able to be single was a gift just like the gifts that are described in 1 Corinthians 12, which we're going to look at later. He uses the exact same language. He had this gift. God had called him to this specifically to be single, but he also recognizes that to remain single as he is, is a gift. It's just a gift from God. It's not anything he's done. It was just something God had done for him. But key in his comment is that you can be occupied with God if you're not occupied with relationship. So what he's doing, he's saying leverage that extra time. Leverage that margin time for the kingdom. So funny, when Jesus was answering a question about the Lord's intentions for marriage, this is what he told a group of Pharisees. He said, that God who had made them at the beginning made them male and female. And he said this for this reason, that a man shall leave the father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one f flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, together, let no man take apart, right? But funny, as the disciples listen to all of this, right? 
There was some flinching going on with the finality of marriage. A few of them, you might know their comments were, well, then it's, they said this, well, then it's just better not to marry. <laughs> that was their response to that. Well, better not to marry. It reminds me of a silly thing said once about marriage. Even though marriages are made in heaven, the maintenance on the earth takes a lot of work. So the disciples are like, hey, it's better not to marry. So if you know the Lord's response, Jesus responds by saying, you know, there are eunuchs that through governance are made eunuchs, right? But there are also eunuchs, meaning people that do not marry, that make that choice for themselves for the sake of the kingdom of God. And this was Paul. And there have been others, right? But, but, but this is important. Paul felt gifted to be single. But his preference was no better than another single who desires to be married. That's really important. I mean, for the record, Paul believes in marriage and is not preaching celibacy as the way of the most devoted. I mean, how do we know this? Well, he would say so later in his writings to Timothy. He said this, now the spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 4 expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. So marriage will forever be a gift from God and it will forever be an institution ordained to play a dramatic role in God's plan of creation. There has to be children, right? And raising children is a ministry. It's critical, a critical ministry. We've had a lot going on so far. You ready to move towards our finish? <laughs> But as we move in that direction, there are these two last sections that, that must be considered, and they are critical matters, right? There was another question posed to Paul about divorce when it came to those families where a new Christian or someone had just given their life there in Corinth to Jesus, and their spouse was unbelieving. And, and if you've been in a relationship where you have an unbelieving spouse, and I've known many here that have, it is very challenging to walk that, very hard to walk that. And so that question has been raised, is it okay to leave the spouse, right? So that was this next question. And so this is what Paul responds with in verse 10, to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So a few minutes ago, I shared Jesus' response to the Pharisees about divorce. And the Lord actually went on to say to them in Matthew 18, that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So that's probably why in verse 10, Paul said, not I, but the Lord has made the commandment. But then he goes on to say further that the Lord has also direction for married people with unsaved spouses. And he says this in verse 12, but to the rest, not, not I, but to the rest, I, not the Lord say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? God is serious about marriage not being broken. Now, Jesus has said in this that other than fornication, 
you are not to leave your spouse. Fornication, again, is something with another person sexually outside of your marriage. That's fornication. I want to say to you, too, that there are another reason or two that a person could leave a spouse. If someone was physically being abused by a spouse, I would speak to the Lord about this and make a decision. Jesus had said, Jesus has said fornicators, fornicators, someone that, that actually cheats on their spouse, uh, has a, an extramarital affair. That would be a reason for divorce. But there have been people, there have been people that have had that situation occur and the spouses are still together. God was able to reconcile those spouses, right? So as we're reading these things, like I said, we only have 40 minutes together. I hope you don't mind that I have these little <laughs> additional in-house comments. But as a pastor, I would just feel negligent not saying these things, right? I just feel like they need to be added, okay? All right? So, so as we look at marriage, though, the overarching principle is that God is serious about it not being broken. And for those living with an unbelieving spouse in Corinth, Paul tells them that if they will live peaceably in that situation, even if it's miserable at times, there's a holy calling on them to find contentment with God and to love that spouse peaceably, knowing there's a possibility of salvation that could come to their spouse. And when you think of Jesus and what he did for us as, 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 as the bride, how behaved have we been? Any here, anyone here ever an enemy of God? Anyone here ever just sinned disobediently, even though we've got this bridegroom that's doing everything right and the bride's doing things wrong? If we look at the model of Jesus, right, you know, we can see why even an unbelieving spouse or maybe something you're trying to work through and this Corinthian they were living with that was just thinking crazy things, but they weren't cheating on the person, right? That Jesus is saying, give the person a chance. Figure out how to make peace in that home and be peaceable in that home because there's a chance the most important thing that's going to happen in that home is someone's going to find Jesus Christ. And wouldn't that be glorious, Right? And so you fight through those things. And so one of the things that I want to mention is we're, we're kind of wrapping up, maybe one of the most important things expressed today, and hopefully not being shared too late in the message, is a framework a few of you have experienced, if you've ever sat through any marriage counseling with me. The creators of a couple's retreat called Weekend to Remember created a powerful curriculum around five common threats to marital oneness and overcoming overcoming threats to oneness preserves and protects a marriage and I was reading about the fact that a lack of knowledge about what marriage entails is one of the leading contributors or contributing factors to divorce and this was in a 2023 study nearly 72% of couples reported that they didn't understand the commitment involved in marriage when they tied the knot Imagine that. Anybody married a... I think it's closer to 100%. <laughs> but, but we'll give them 72%. Yeah, there were 28% there that thought they knew what they could expect. And it was interesting that many divorced people said they were surprised. Now listen to this. They were surprised that their partner changed over their marriage and were just unable to personally cope with the new problems that arose with the other person. I look at Cheryl and I and how much change it's gone on with us and what we've, what we've had to tolerate with one another and to work through and to figure out. And I'm going to tell you all right now, if you'll stick with it if you're married, you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. It's worth fighting for, okay? And, and, and these five threats to oneness are just optimal areas of weakness that the devil just predictably just takes a swing at. He's like, he knows your weaknesses. He's been watching us for thousands of years. Since God made humans, he's been watching and from day one, figuring out the weaknesses. 
And so these particular areas that, that we can to remember highlight are five areas that go like this. One is difficult adjustments. And a difficult adjustment could be a spouse gets a new job, right? A spouse loses a job. A difficult adjustment could be the other person's family. When you're around the family, you had no idea there were a couple of family members that were going to be that involved in your lives. You know? Or or you didn't know how you were going to be treated by a mother-in-law. And you're adjusting to these things. And there are some people that just literally like, I don't want it. I don't want it. Because it's too hard and I want easy. And how many of us know that anything worth anything is hard? Anything that creates beauty and grandeur and splendor in your life typically took a lot of work. That's why a learning curve is a learning curve. And a learning curve is, is, is difficult. It's not easy. It's a ramp like this, and it takes a long time, right? And so that first area, that first area is difficult adjustments. The next area is the world pattern. It's the 50-50 worldview, meaning you do your 50%, I'll do my 50%. You're not doing your part, I'm not doing my part. Guess what's going to happen? Divorce. There are times as a married couple, and even in friendships, There are times that you have to give 100% for a couple of years and the other person gives 1%, 2% because they're that hurt. The question is, will we have the heart to love them when they're that hurt and they just can't give? They might have a loss of a family member, right? They might have a loss of a job. They might have something going on with their health and they can't give. And if you're doing that 50-50 world pattern, it's never gonna work. It leads to brokenness. It breaks oneness. And the next area is is, um, inevitable difficulties. So inevitable difficulties are going to happen. There are things that are coming that for whatever reason, when that difficulty comes, the, 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 the couple struggle to stay together. It could be the loss of a child. It could be a number of things. But those inevitable difficulties, the question is, at that time, will people be able to come together and work through those things? The next thing, extramarital affairs. We all know about that. That's an extramarital affair with uh, someone that's not your spouse, or it could be a work affair. It could be some other type of affair, some other type of addiction that takes you from your spouse when that time should be with your spouse. And then, not surprisingly, selfishness. I remember our first year of marriage and then we had our first child. I had no idea how selfish I was until we had the first child. It's like, you mean the world's not about me? (laughs) It's about my kid and my wife. And I had to make that shift. All right. That's all I'm going to say about those for now. But as I was going through these things, I thought it's time for a marriage class. Calvary Chapel. Paul's final words point now. To our finish, it's a singular summarizing conclusion, and that's why we're going to just finish it by reading the whole thing together. He starts in verse 17, making a case, whether married, single, and then he he uses other examples of different states, or living with an unbelieving spouse. No matter what, the state that we find ourselves in, willingly or unwillingly, There's only one relationship that matters more than all. And it is the one that lasts eternally. And for the marrieds, you remember what Jesus said about marriage in heaven. There is no marriage in heaven. Marriage is for the earth. Our relationship with God is number one. That's the marriage that lasts forever. And in verse 17, but as God has distributed to each one, As the Lord has called to each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. And he's talking about a religious right there and part of of, of an agreement and covenanting that occurred in the Old Old Testament. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. So it was an act of devotion. He's saying right now, the circumcision of the heart is the most thing, or most important thing that matters, to keep the commandments of God. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? 
Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. There in Rome, more than one third of people were slaves. So he's saying, if you're a slave, just love God, remain in him and be content, right? For he who is called in the Lord while a slave, verse 22, is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. So he's saying, whether you're in the state of slavery, which you wouldn't want to be in, still remain faithful to the Lord, okay? Whether you have gone through all the right religious things as prescribed by the Old Testament or not, the ultimate and what matters to God is that you walk in his commandments and you do that, that right thing. And if you're married, do the right thing. In that state, if you're unmarried, if you're single, if you want to be married, if you've been divorced, if you've been hurt by another person, no matter what that state is, the most important thing is just to remain in God. It's your one safe place is what he's saying. That's what Paul's saying here. And so he says, you were bought in verse 23 at a price. So do not become slaves of men, brethren. Let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. And to emphasize the most important relationship that matters today, we finish with this. What matters in our relationship with God is that you and me, all of us, remain in him no matter the state to which we are called. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning grateful for the word of God. We gather together as your children, knowing that each one of us in hearing this teaching on marriage mostly are in a number of different places when it comes to this institution. But Father, this morning as we come to you now, we lift up the marriages that are represented in this church as they do bring glory to you and glorify you, and we know that. And we pray, Lord, that those marriages would be a witness all the days that the couple are together on this earth to bring glory to you no matter what, and in whatever state, God, that reconciliation and oneness would prevail. And for those that are here today that are single and there's pain around that, and there's a desire to have a companion, God, may, may, may our brothers and sisters in that state remain in you knowing that you have ordained for them what has been planned for their lives. And that, Lord, that that particular relationship that could be the desire of many that it will be fulfilled through your will, God, and what you will for us as people. For those that have been hurt and have been divorced or have been cheated on or some type of affair or whatever it may be that's going on in, in our lives and in our hearts because of that, Father, we ask for healing knowing that, Lord, you are our bridegroom, that Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. And one day we think of the apostle Paul's words and we shall see him, we'll be like him. We shall see him as he is, that you will share that glory with us and we'll just be wrapped up in a relationship that is just beyond the earth and it's beyond words because it will be with you, God, in that in eternal inheritance that you've promised to each one that has given their life to Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those today that are struggling in their marriages and they have an unbelieving spouse, we pray, Lord, that you would provide those individuals a, a steadfast heart and a, a mind, Lord, that is controlled by you and that the peace of Christ would prevail when you said, let not your hearts be troubled. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you not as the world gives, that you would give those that are in an unpeaceable marriage a peace that they need to prevail regardless of whatever the difference is so that that oneness would bring glory to you. It's in Christ's name we pray together. Amen. Would you stand with me? Next week, the verses will shift to more on singles and marrieds and others. If anyone needs any prayer this morning, please Come forward. There'll be someone to pray with you. It's good to spend time with you all this morning.
to spend time in the word of God. So now benediction. So the Lord bless you all. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you in whatever state you're in today that you sense his love. And may his graciousness fall upon you and may he put his name on your heads as you walk. And as we sang earlier today, only his image of love on my chest, seal of forgiveness and assurance of rest. That's a way to look, right? As we enter the spaces that we walk in this week, the places we'll go, the people will see that his image of love is what we lead with because his love's everything to us. Wouldn't you agree? If you agree, say amen. <laughs> amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great Sunday, everyone.